Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta. And Nathaniel tells about stability for point processes and range in Randall Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. I guess I don't need a microphone because uh, my wife keeps complaining I'm too loud, I guess. You can hear me, right, in the back? Okay, okay so uh, first of all, it's an honor. I was quite confident of myself. My wife, I was quite confident of me. Okay, so uh, do you have anything else to say? <laughs> It's a great honor to be here, honestly, and uh, firstly because I graduated from Cornell. I was here from 2002-2007, so great to come back. And of course, I would like to thank uh, the scientific committee to you know, invite me, and especially Gina and Pierre for organizing a great conference. Great dinner yesterday also, so thanks. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, this is a conference on cell similarity. I, I thought about a bit before sending the abstract whether this would be a right thing to do, but this has this concept of stability of point processes. And stability and self similarity are related, so I thought I'll talk about this one. And in the proof, actually, we are using self similarity of particular measure very much. Only in the end, if I get time and you know, if, if there is time, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. Okay, so what is, so there are, there are a few phrases here. So I'll start from the first phrase, which is the stability for point processes. And then I'll move on to branching language. So what is a stable point process? So essentially, okay, so whatever I'm doing here can be also done for point processes whose points are coming from real line, but for simplicity, I'm just going to present things where the points are actually positive. Every point process is going to be taking values in the positive. All the points are going to be positive in this talk. Okay, so here is a definition. And this definition is by David of Monchanov and Zoe. They wrote paper in 2008, and there was a follow-up paper in 2011. So what is this definition? They said that a point process, I'm going to write PP to mean point process. And again, for this talk, the points are positive. Is alpha stable? If, so alpha here is a something positive. If, so I'll write down an equation, so I'll make sense out of it afterwards. Okay, if this happens for every A1, A2 positive, now what do I mean by that? So I mean that you just take two positive real numbers. What do I mean by multiplying a point process by, by a number? I mean that you take the point process, look at the points, go back to the points, multiply each and every point by that number. So you're not really multiplying the point process itself, but you're multiplying the points. So in other words, what I'm saying is, if n is of this form, so the points are given by xi, then say 10 times n would be just this guy. This is my definition. Okay, so what do I mean by plus? By plus, I mean superposition of point processes. So you have two point processes, you throw all the points in. So essentially, if you multiply the points by a1 of one point process, multiply a2, another point process, that's what I'm doing. I'm then adding them by superposing. Now, what do I mean n1 and n2? These are nothing but independent copies of n. IID copies of n. So you see the similarity of definition with a stable random variable. It's more or less the same definition, except that now we don't have the restriction of alpha between 0 and 2. Alpha can be 10,000 also. Okay. That's the only difference. Okay, so this is the def definition. This you know, I saw first this definition when I was still a PhD student. I was young, well, younger, before Dawar asked me the question. <laughs> so, and very arrogant. So I used to think whatever I, I read and cannot find an application within five minutes is useless. So, you know, I, I thought it, it's a very abstract concept, doesn't have any application and so on. But now I'm finding it to be useful. I'm becoming slightly older. Okay, 
So what is what is the main thing about this? So the main result that they had in this paper is you can call it a sort of like a Lapage representation for this kind of one process. Oh, so here is a theorem. It's defined for me. So the same device they proved in 2008. So the theorem says it characterizes when is a, a point process n going to be stable in their sense, in this definition. So n is alpha stable. If and only if there exists a point process P such that so alpha is a parameter of the point process P is going to be another parameter but an infinite, infinite dimensional parameter but still going to be a parameter such that n can be represented in law as follows <coughs> where what are these PIs? So this P1, P2 are IID copies of P. And these lambda i's, lambda i's are essentially points of a Poisson point process. So what is that Poisson point process? So if you look at delta lambda i, this is a Poisson random measure on R plus, well when I say R plus, I'm okay, I, I'll just write zero in P. And the in intensity measure is nu alpha, but nu alpha is a unique measure for which the right tail is given by x power minus alpha. We all know this measure, it's one of our favorite measures. Okay, so and you need these points to be independent. The lambda i's and pi i's should be independent. And where again dot here means multiplying the points, addition means superposition, same thing. So essentially what I'm saying is that a stable point process, a point process is stable if and only if, it can be represented as a superposition of same ID copies of same point process multiplied by numbers. The numbers itself come from a Poisson point process. Okay. So you, one, one can invent a notation and one can say that in this case n follows stable the parameters alpha and theta. It's a distributional thing. Everything is given in distribution. Yes. So if you want to understand That's another way of looking at it. But the, actually, you're right. You're right. Some some sort of that way is true. But the way I was thinking about it is for stable random variables, you have series representation, Laplace representation. It's some kind of analog of that. That's what they said in their paper also. But maybe maybe you're right. Uh, we have to think about maybe you can. Maybe you can, yes. But for me it's like a representation, so maybe you're right. Maybe maybe it's like it's that, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so now why do I care about this now? I mean one reason I care is now I'm getting it as a video. Sorry, I'm missing out. I'll pull it down again. Okay, so I'm, I'm getting this kind of limits in branching random walk. So first I have to explain you what is a branching random walk. So it's going to be a digression now. So branching random walk, I'm just going to write BRW. I'll first describe it to you and then give you the motivation and history because it needs a bit of motivation. So here is a picture. So I'm going to draw some lines here. So this will be generation zero. Is it big enough for everybody? Am I writing big enough? Generation one, this is generation two. Okay, so now I start in generation zero with exactly one particle. By the way, all the action is going to take place on the positive part of real line. So I view positive part of real line. Okay. So, and this will be the fact, this will relate to the fact that my point process is only taking positive values. Okay. So I'll start with exactly one point at zero. Now, at this point, this particle has a, has a point process. 
well, well, has an independent copy of a point process L, which takes only positive values. Now, what does this guy do? He branches into many particles according to this point process and moves. So, in this first generation, may this first branch, you say it has two branches. So, first particle goes here, second one goes here. First or second doesn't really matter, one of them goes here, one of them goes here. Okay, that's it. That's the mechanism for the first generation. Now you have two points. Of course, it may not be two. It may, it's actually random. But now in this realization, it's two. Now what happens? Note that both the particles' displacements are positive. That's because I assume it to be positive. There's no need to do that, but this is for simplicity. Okay. Here, this particle again is going to branch. It branches into three. So this goes, one of them goes here, one of them comes here, and then here. So for example, if you draw a line like that, so this is the displacement of this particular point. But it's in this position because it's already in this position, and then move forward. So we're only moving to the right. So this might have two of them, so maybe one comes here, and one comes here. And this goes on. So you now see what is going on. And this guy, in this particle here, also had an IID copy of the same point process L, so this guy. So you see, what is happening is, <coughs> this, this is going on. So now, a few things I should tell you is that different point processes and different particles are independent. However, the displacements coming from one particle, so you have one particle branching into various ones, right? Those displacements may not be independent. So these guys, like this displacement here, this one, may depend on each other. Although the displacement for this particle here and this particle can be will be independent because I'm taking IID copies of point processes. One more thing I'm going to assume. So displacement coming from the same particle may not be independent. Everything else is independent. Also, I'm going to assume that the branching mechanism and displacements are going to be independent. So branching is independent. It's independent of displacement. Okay, so is the model clear? So I haven't assumed anything on how the displacement behaves and so on, but it's just a rough description. Yes. So I missed the part you said each point on your graph is not a particle, but a particle of point process? What yes. So so basically you're getting I'll I'll, I'll I'll explain it even further. So so essentially I'll explain it more mathematically later. This is just a rough description. So this branching and displacements are together given by a point process. I'll tell you exactly what it means. Once I write down more mathematically, you can begin. Okay. So there's a bit of history to it. So this was first, so this, this concept of branching random walk was, I think, started in the 70s sometime, 76 maybe. It was started by Hammersley, followed by a paper of Kingman, and then the main work was done by Begins. He did a lot of work in the 70s. And then there was a related concept for branching Brownian motion, where you start with one particle branch into, always branch into two, and then do Brownian motion for an exponential time, exponential clock. Okay. So that is called branching Brownian motion. That's a continuum version of the same thing. And this was introduced by Maury Brams in 78, I think, I remember. Anyway, all these concepts were there. And they, they were a hot topic in the 70s. And then suddenly, there were not so many papers about it. But now, people have found connections of branching random walks with various objects. First of all, it's a very important model in statistical physics. I don't know exactly why, but also in biology. So I think it's, you can model it to, you know, for modeling, say, you use it to model mechanism or, or growth of particles in an environment or something. You don't have to restrict to R. You can, you can have points moving in R2 and so on. You can do that. And then recent connections are especially with kind of objects like free polymers, you know, fast passive percolation, free fields, and so on, which has made this area very prominent. Especially the extremes of branching random walk, whatever I mean by that, I'll come to that, is very much connected to the extremes of Gaussian free field. Okay? And that's why this has become extremely important. And I'd like to mention a few papers in this area which connect these extremes of branching random walk and Gaussian free field. Not only in the extremes. And one of them is by Bramson and Zaytuni. So this is in 2012. 
and then another one is Ramson Ling MZ2. And there are two other papers that are relevant here also. They are, they are by Bistu and Luido. So it's 2013 and I think another in 2014. And this one is in the archive in 2014. Yeah, so uh, I'm mixing things up. Like some of the years are the published years, some of the years and the according to the archive. So yeah. Oh. So because of these connections, th this area becomes extremely important. And then what am I interested in this in this work? So at least I should give that first. So I'm, I'm going to look at a point process sequence, NN. What is NN? N is essentially the point process of quote unquote normalized positions of particles coming from NN generation. So I'll write down that. So the point process of positions, normalized positions, of nth generation particles Now what I'm interested in that's getting good enough for me, I think. What I'm interested in is the question that I'm going to look at is does NN converge weakly? It's a sequence of point processes, right? For every N, you have a point process. My question is does it converge weakly? If at all it converges, where does it converge? Now I should tell you that there is a very important conjecture related to this which I'm going to write down now. It's by two physicists. Oh, okay. So this only can go down, right? So do that. So in, in other words, 
you take a point process, which is superposable, and then you take exponential math on the points, what you're going to get is going to be stable point process. So this will give you a stable point process. You do the same for whatever descriptive decorated Poisson process is. You do the same thing, you take an exponentiation of the points, what you'll get is basically you'll get a Laplace representation. Basically, the representation, as Dabar was calling it, some sort of you know, definity. So you see those are equivalent because of DMZ, right? So, so because of DMZ, these are equivalent. They have already proved it. So here is an alternative proof of the, of the result of my life. I think this is 2008. So you just come here, use stability is equivalent to this, and then go back by taking logs. Remember, I have made life simple by taking only positive points. So log is well defined, no problem. So you can do that. That's an alternative proof of the same fact. In fact, if you read Mylar's paper, he has mentioned that he had a very first version of the paper, and then immediately I think Ilya Molchanov said that you know this is another way of doing it. So he proved that, he made that comment in the paper, it's in the introduction also in his paper. And then in this paper is in ECP. Okay, so this, you see this is the connection. So the first guess that you can make from the Brunner the conjecture is that if you have habitual dis displacement, did you have a question? Okay. If you have habitual displacement, then the limit should be stable. That's the conjecture. I mean, it's just a conjecture transferred to this language. And it is indeed true. Before I move on, I'd just like to mention that this conjecture was settled for branching Brownian motion by two groups. One is the French group, so again, you have to excuse my pronunciation. So, it's, uh, this was proved for branching Brownian motion for two groups. One is uh, uh, Adipon, Beristiti, Brunet, and Xi. This was a paper in 2013 in PTRF. And then, there was another paper which arrived you know, at the same time in PTRF. This was by uh, Arduin, Bovier, and Kister. Both of them solved this problem. What they observed was, well, this conjecture was true, except that either you have to, in the normalization, you have to allow random normalization, or you have to make a compromise. What they got was, they got a decorative Poisson process plus some random shift. So they called it randomly shifted. First, a random shift. And if you know what it is, this random shift comes from, well, it is related to the de limit of the derivative model. Okay. Anyway, it doesn't matter, there's a random shift there. And they really didn't coin the term, perhaps, I think, Kofor Zaytuni and his student Elan Suha, I think they coined the term randomly shifted decorative Poisson process. So this essentially the limit is a randomly shifted. So they call it S S uh, S D P P. I think. I don't know. S D P P P or something, something. Anyway, the point is that there's a random shift involved. What we have, we don't have exactly stable. You see, here things are like tailed or things in the Gumbel domain of attraction. Now we are moving to displacements, which is going to be the Frechet domain of attraction. So all the shifting things would become scaly. So what we'll see is we'll see stable, and there'll be random scaling involved. So that's going to be the theorem for us. But before presenting the theorem, I'm now going to be a little bit more mathematical. I'm going to write down my assumptions. Is there any question before I move on? Okay, so now I'll, I'll write down things slightly more nicely. Maybe I'll use only these four, these two codes. I'll do the other Let that remain. Okay, so what are my assumptions? Not one thing, when I describe point you know, branching random work, I deliberately didn't tell you one thing, is that, okay, suppose you forget about the positions of the points. Suppose you only keep track of how many points there are in the energy generation. Then what are you going to get? You're just going to get a Gunter Watson process. Right? It's as simple as that. So, what you do is, first observe that if Zn is a number of particles, because you don't care about the position, so 
in the nth generation, it's very important observation. Then Zn is nothing but so for every n bigger than or equal to zero, then Zn is nothing but a Dalton Watson process with Z0 being 1. Now of course the offspring distribution depends on the point process L. Okay, how many points the L will allow you. So that will come to later, but first we'll make some assumptions on the underlying branching process. First of all, I'm talking about any generation of the points. If the tree doesn't survive all the way to infinity, it doesn't make any sense. So I have to make the tree survive. Of course, that means that I need the tree to be super, you know, the branching process to be super critical. So zeroth assumption is that branching process Z1 has expectation which I call mu. I define this to be mu. This is between 1 and infinity. So I assume it's finite also. Okay. So immediately we all know in this room that that means Zn power mu power n is a non-negative Martingale which is going to convert almost surely to a random variable w which is non-negative. We know this. I'm going to make a further simplifying assumption. So let me call it a 0.5 because I'm going to write a1 very soon. So this is a simplifying assumption. This is not needed. I'm just doing it so that I can give an easier talk. Oh, so I'm assuming that Z1 is never going to be zero. So in other words, I'm not allowing any leaf in my Galton Watson tree. Obviously, this will immediately tell you that the tree has to survive with probability one. Okay. So this means that it implies that tree survives. So it's an infinite tree with probability one. That makes life a little bit easier. Otherwise, we just have to condition on the survival and work with the conditional properties. But that makes life difficult, so let's achieve that. Now, one more assumption, very crucial assumption we need is the L-Logel assumption. It's a Keston-Sigam condition. So this is sort of the last assumption on the underlying branching process. So this says that expectation of Z1 times log of Z1 is finite. Now in general you should have a log plus, but since I'm assuming Z1 is at least one, so we can just keep log. So these two together would immediately imply that the limit has to be positive with probability one. Okay. Otherwise it's going to be positive conditional on the survival. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So in this talk, because I'm going to use this as a scaling, so it better be positive. I will divide it by W sometimes, I multiply and so on. I don't want to multiply or divide by zero. So I'm making sure it's possible. Okay, so these are the first assumptions, and these are assumptions of the branching processes. Now, what are my assumptions on that? Sorry, I'm completely messing it up. Sorry about that. Okay. So now I need assumptions on the displacements. So as I said in this, you know, if, if you forget everything about the scriptic things that I've said, all we care about is this part, the displacement should be, you know, heavy tail. So what do I mean by that? So what is my L? I, I told you what is L, and Isa immediately asked me a question, what is, what is L, and so on. He didn't really ask that, but that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm write down what is L, and then you'll see how it goes. So L would be essentially, a particular L would be equal in distribution with something like this. So this is my A2. I equal to 1 to Z1. Sorry. x1, x2, up to so on, you have an infinite sequence of random variables. So in other words, you have an r infinity value of random variables. r plus infinity, I'm going to assume all the xi's are positive. So r plus infinity value of random variables, x1, x2, so on, such that for a particular realization, you're only going to take up to z1. z1 is a branching. So 
Basically, the idea is this means that the particle will branch into Z1 many particles, and the first particle or one of the particles will have displacement x1, another particle will have displacement x2, up to the Z1 particle will have displacement x of Z1. That is what this means. It's just a fancy of writing the same thing. Now, of course, then I have to assume what are these xi's. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense that, first of all, this Z1 is going to be completely independent. Branching mechanism is going to be independent of the displacements of the entire sequence x1, x2, and so on. And these are the things. First of all, I'll assume that each of the xi, so the xi's are going to be identically distributed. They may not be independent, but they will be identically distributed. So various points are going to displace according to the same distribution. It doesn't make, it's not a huge assumption. So each xi follows a distribution f that belongs to the regular, which is a regularly varying distribution with you know, exponent minus half. What do I mean by that? So again, I want to keep life simple. Again, simpli for simplification, I'm going to write down, this roughly means probability of say x1. All of them are same distribution anyway. So x1 bigger than x is going to behave like a constant times x power minus alpha as x goes to infinity. Now of course, truly, if I, if I want to be truthful to regular variation, I should put a regular slowly varying function there. But I'm being too, too generous here, you know, too liberal. Let, let it be a constant, eventually. It's okay. For me, for this talk, it's fine. So, so this is the important thing is all of them have the same distribution. Secondly, it should be jointly regularly varying. But however, we don't have 15 random variables here. We have an infinite sequence. Z1 can take any value, right? So therefore, we need a concept of regular variation on R plus infinity. By the way, all the xi's are positive. So all the xi's are, say, non-negative. I'm allowing 0, so it doesn't mean anything. So I'm calling this 0 infinity R plus. So I'm going to assume that the entire sequence, x1, x2, this is regularly varying minus alpha on f r plus infinity with regular variation measured lambda. So this is, I have to tell you what it means. Oh, that means, what does it mean? So this means that, okay, so I'm going to describe to you a convergence. So regular variation means some sort of convergence. When you talk about regular variation on real line, you talk about vague convergence. So somehow you have to define vague convergence on R plus infinity. But the trouble, the topological trouble is that R plus infinity is not locally compact, so there might be some troubles. So don't compactify, use a different convergence. That's the solution. So basically, Hult and Linskov, they came up with this convergence, this definition. So I'm going to use this convergence. So what is the convergence? What does it mean? It means n times, you look at this vector, x1, x2, and so on, scale this vector by n power 1 over alpha. Now, if, if this is not a constant, if this is a slowly varying function, you will have something different. You will have a, another slowly varying function here. But let's not worry about it. This belongs to a set A, will converge to lambda of A for all A inside R plus infinity such that there should be two cases. Firstly, A should be bounded away from the zero vector. So 0, which is 0, 0, and so on, this is not in the enclosure. And A should be a lambda continuity set. So lambda of delta A is going to be 0. So it's very much like vague convergence, except that now we cannot compactify it because it's not locally compact. You can compactify it, then you're going to be in a mess. So avoid that, we just write it like this. Lambda has to be a measure. Here, lambda is a measure. Lambda is a measure on R plus infinity, such that with any ball from zero, so you look at R plus infinity minus a ball of any, any ball, so 
Look at that. Lambda will be finite outside that point. So only lambda can screw up only near zero. Outside that is nice. That's the point. So it's essentially if you just consider instead of infinity, if you just write r, this is just a rewrite, you know, re rewriting of vague convergence. That's all. Okay. So this uh, this convergence is due to Hulda Linska, and it has been used by many people recently. So it's a it's a it's a very, very nice way of so compromising vague convergence in, in a more general sense. Yes? Uh, are you using specific matrix or Usually. Usually. Component-based Yeah. Okay. So, these are my assumptions. So, roughly speaking, what I am saying, so I'll use this word for some time and then I'll go back. So roughly speaking, what I'm saying is the branching is supercritical, it satisfies Kessel's Lum condition, and the displacements are heavy -tipped. Whatever it is. Formalization is this. Oh, now I can give you some examples so that I think the assumption too looks a bit abstract. So what would be examples? One example would be. So this is basically, so I should tell you a little bit of history also. So there are there has been some works on branching random walks with heavy gel displacements. I should tell you a little bit of history also. So one case was the first work was by Rick Duret in 1979 and 1983. Two works essentially. One of them in PTRF and then another one in uh, Orbitrf and then another one in SP. So what he had is he had the same, this model only, and then this xi is but iid. iid regularity. Except that he didn't assume the Keston Sigum condition, but he only looked at the maximum. He didn't look at the point process. He just looked at, at the nth generation, what is the rightmost point? Call it rn. So Rn is the rightmost point in the energy generation. And then what he showed is that this grows like mu power in the world. And if you take the ratio, it goes in distribution to a mixture of Fresher distribution. And the mixture is given by the Martin Gilgamesh W. Of course, you would ask, what is W unless you have Kessel's Trigon condition? But then you don't use the, you know, Zn over mu power n. You use the, what is it for? Seneta high unit. So it's a Seneta high unit of Z. But anyway, don't worry about it. If you have Kessel's Trigon condition, this is precisely what you had. Yes. I don't understand why uh, this convergence. So, yes, uh, and the problem is, okay, so to just tell you a long story short is that when you are in Rd or fun, the moment you go to R infinity, what may happen is you compactify it, so you have this closure, right, extra closure, which is essentially noise. What if your lambda charges mass on that? Assuming that lambda of the number is zero. Yeah, then I think it would be equivalent to that. I think so. You have to extra assume that. Yeah. But this, the same assumption is for RD. No, but RD then is obvious. You don't have to assume. It, it comes automatically. So that is the topological description. So under this assumption, uh, yes, yes, same. yes. That it don't be in there. Then it's okay. Then it's okay. Yes. Actually, the main point is that R infinity is a much simpler space. You have to do it in much more complicated spaces, function spaces, measure spaces, and so on. Spaces of measures and so on. And then you really need. Otherwise, you are in trouble. Like, for example, you look at the paper of Gena and Hult on uh, large relations for point processes. They are using this convergence also. Right? So, in order to define regular variation for point processes, that's very really important. Yeah, I infinity, you can do away, do away with this abstract. I agree. Okay. 
So thanks for the question. So you have this v power n over alpha. So that means perhaps from extreme value theory we know so R n is the maximum of all the guys in the generation. So the right scaling should be mu power n over alpha. So what we do is we look at. Oh by the way, I I, I would like to just mention that Steve Dresnik was not here today. You know, so uh, because he I think he's not well. Uh, I checked with him, so he's not well. So and his student George Troy they proved recently in a paper that if you look at xi, if you look at xi the moving average with heavy tail innovations, regularly varying innovations, of course the moving average should make sense. You should, should have some summability conditions on the alpha on the coefficients and so on. That whatever you need, then also this will be regularly varying and they computed the lambda. So they, those also would be examples. You know, just xi is independent is not 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 it. I mean there are other examples. Okay. So now, therefore, here is our theorem. So this is my, by the way, I didn't mention that there's a joint work with Ayan Bhattacharya and my colleague Rajesh Shubh Bhajra. Uh, Ayan Bhattacharya is my PhD student. So it's a joint work with two of us. So this is by Ayan, Rajan, and myself, which says that suppose Nn is the point process of n generation displacements divided by mu power n over alpha because that's the scale in which the maxima is growing. So that's the right scale. Then nn converges in distribution n star where n star is a randomly scaled Stable process. I'll, I'll leave a gap here. Alpha stable point process. So alpha stable, whatever I defined in the beginning, is definition of the lead of Volchanov and so And the scaling is by W power one over alpha. So in other words, you take a stable point process, look at the points, you take an independent copy of W, is independent of all the points in the, you know, in the stable point process. Multiply the points by W power one over. That's going to be. You can make another compromise. You can divide instead by W power 1 over alpha times that, but don't have to do that. So instead of randomly shifted decorated Poisson process, we are just getting randomly scaled stable process. It's a stable point. Okay, so I'd like to now say maybe one minute about the proof. And one thing that one can ask me, okay, where is the self similarity in this whole picture? So I'll just try to briefly tell you where self similarity plays a role. I'm not going to give you the proof. It's going to be rather long. But what is what is the importance of self similarity? It's called business. So, okay, so the rough, very, very rough idea of the proof is that you have to find the limit of Nn. But don't find the limit of Nn, which is more complicated. But try to use what is known as the one large jump principle to somehow move to another point process, which will be slightly easier to handle. So I'm not going to describe you that point process. That's going to be too long. Mm -hmm. But I'll just write down that instead of Nn, I'm going to work with some Nn minimum. And this is the point process, which is essentially point process associated with a random field indexed by a galton morrison tree. That's all I have to say. I'm not going to say anything anymore. Now, since there's an underlying galton morrison tree, what we can do is the usual thing. So I'm going to write, draw it. I'm not going to bore you anymore. It's just the last one I'm going to So you have something like that, and so on. What you do is the usual thing. In a galton morrison process, a tree, you can always do the following. So suppose this is the energy generation. You cut the tree at the n minus k generation. Of course, this will, and forget about this part. Then you have another point process, which will be more or less this point process. So use a truncation. So take the limit as n goes to infinity, then take the limit as k goes to infinity. And show that this truncation works. 
Now the reason that this works is that now how many points do you have? You have z of n minus k many such Galton Watson processes, but you are only going up to k many generations. For a fixed k, you just have so many point processes induced by these trees. Take one such point process. One such point process is going to be regularly very in the sense of full time in at the level of point processes. There you actually need that. But and whenever you have regular variation, you have a, li you have a limit measure. Right? Lambda was a limit measure. And that limit measure, any regular variation will give you a limit measure that is self singular. So you will get a limit measure, which is a measure on measures. So, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a slightly complicated object, but that measure is going to be self similar. And that measure, if I call it n star, is going to satisfy this kind of an equation. Lambda, I'm going to use lambda. A times a is going to be a power minus alpha, sorry, minus alpha n star times a. And in the proof, we actually encash this cell in that area. And the proof completely goes by the convergence of the underlying Laplace function. So you look at the Laplace function of n n tilde, n n tilde after the truncation, and then show that it converges. And in the process, you use the cell in that area. That's all I have to say. Well, no, we didn't have for, for uh, the kitchen has just for random variables. Okay, 